Hey everyone. Nice to see you all. All right, give me one second here. All right. All right. So, um Rachel is is your name Rachel? Yeah, I don't have a Rachel in the class. So, Do you know how to change your name? Rachel my all right what's your name rachel oh reagan you got your bunny oh <laughs> awesome oh look what a cute oh i like the markings on its face like that that's really cute great kate thank you thank you i knew i didn't have a rachel in this class so that threw me just a little bit all right how are you all do you guys have a good summer yeah, anybody do anything unusual or wonderful? No? <laughs> All right, sometimes it's nice just to have a quiet and restful summer, isn't it? Yeah, excellent. All right, let's see here. So I also do not have a Mason listed. Um, is your name Mason? Or is it Carson? My name is Carson, but I'm okay. Okay. Do you, I mean, do you know how to change your name on this? Um, if you click the little dots beside at the top right corner of your picture, um, um, then one of them should be renamed. Yeah. Okay. It's helpful to me, especially as I'm just getting to know you guys. If you can, <clears throat> if you can make sure that you type your name that you would prefer to be called um, in that, in that box right there, because that's how I'll call on you. So I see some familiar faces. Welcome back everybody and a couple new ones so it's good to see all of you and i'm really excited for this i think this we have a nice size class so i think this will be this will be awesome one two three four and everybody's here today very good all right so let's go ahead and get started let me make sure we have sound on okay perfect so welcome to honors biology we um Let's see here. Biology, of course, is the study of living things, and that's what we'll be learning about all this year. So we'll go over a little bit about what we're going to cover today. Before we really jump in to the lesson, this first day, we have to cover some business things, some information topics. So I'll do that now. We'll go through that as quickly as we can. Most of you guys, I think, are returning AIM Academy students. If you are new to AIM Academy, especially if you're new to Canvas, if you've never used Canvas before, make sure that you watch the tutorial video that I put in the class resources section. So on our homepage, you'll see this right here where it says class resources. If you click on that, it'll take you to a page that has these on it. So that one right there, how to navigate in Canvas, will tell you what you need to know in order to be able to use Canvas. There's also these other resources there as well, the supplies list, instructions to write a lab report, some important beginning and endings of words, and then how to put an image in Canvas. Those are all things that you will be, uh, that will help you to be able to, to know those things. <clears throat> now, I wanna talk about our course structure. So for those of you who have had my classes before, in my other classes, I list due dates every day. In this class, we have due dates by the week. So you have all week to get done the things that have a due date listed as Friday. So don't wait until the end of the week because there's way too much work for you to do on just one day. You wanna spread it out over the four days that come before in that week. Now, like, like always my in my classes, the due dates are flexible. So I don't take off points if you submit things after the due date. I'd rather that you take your time and do a good job rather than rushing to get something done by the due date. So even if you have to turn something in a week or so late, it's not a problem. You don't ever have to write to me and ask me for more time. It's just built in. You always have more time. Now, if you start to fall too far behind, I'll be getting in touch with you because that can be, um, that can make you overwhelmed. It makes it very difficult. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So this course structure was something being due at the end of the week. Some online teachers, some AIM Academy teachers do it that way. I never have before. So for me, this is an experiment. I'm doing a, con a controlled experiment here, changing one thing 
I'm just going to change the due date and see how it works. So I'm going to reevaluate. And as the year goes on, I may change things. But for now, this is the way we're going to do it. I would love your feedback to let me know whether you like once a week due dates or not. That allows you to sort of work as much, as far ahead as you want to, you know, get, you could get it all done on Monday and Tuesday if you want, and then have the rest of the week off. I just do recommend not waiting until the very last day. Don't wait till Friday to get everything in. <clears throat> so I want you to, um, you guys, great job. Everybody has their webcams on. We have to have webcams on at least at the beginning of class. If you have a problem, if there's ever an issue, you know, you've got a horrible cold <laughs> or you're going to be eating breakfast or dinner, whatever, and you can't have the camera on for a bit, just let me know. And, um, and that's fine. But if you possibly can, I like the cameras to be on all the time. We get to know each other better and I get to know you better. It's a lot easier to participate. Um, studies have shown that when people leave cameras on, they actually do learn more. So I think it's an important thing for you to make sure that you leave your camera on. Also, you guys, being that you're, you know, your honors, high school students, odds are pretty good. You're going to be going to college. At least you might be getting a job. You might be getting into some kind of program. There may come a day when you want me to write a letter of recommendation for you. And let's say there's two students. They both have straight A's. One student leaves her camera on the whole time and I get to know her really well, participates in class. The other student never has a camera on. It's always just a black screen and I never interact with that student at all. You can tell which one it's going to be easier for me to write the recommendation for, the one who leaves her camera on. So if I know you, then I can give you a better reference. I want to also talk about this AI, artificial intelligence. So no doubt you have encountered it. You may have run into it before. One of the most common, most popular ones is ChatGPT, but there's a lot of different AI programs. Um, you have to be over 13 in order to use it. I think all of you guys are. If you're not, you're not allowed to use it even with parental consent. If you're between 13 and 18, you can only use it if you have permission from your parent in order to be able to use it. So what AI is, um, you can think of AI as being an expert that's sitting right next to you in your room, an expert on every possible subject. So you can use AI to help you learn. In fact, if you're between those ages and you get parental permission, I think it's a great way to get more information. If there's a concept that you really are struggling with, you can say, you know, help, uh, type in chat GPT, go there and say, AI, help me understand the difference between mitochondria and chloroplasts in a cell. It'll walk you through that. It'll help you to understand that. What you can't do though, is use AI to give answers to test questions. You have to get them yourself. So you guys are all honor students. You're all in high school. I expect you to work with integrity, with academic integrity. And I want you to learn how to think on your own. When you copy and paste either from a website or from AI, it just shows me that you know how to copy and paste. We all already know how to do that. So I want you to learn how to think on your own, how to come up with answers, on your own and using chat GPT won't help you in the long run because you're going to get to the point where you can't use it and you haven't learned something. So you have to be here, make your time count, um, learn how to learn and not just make a priority of good grades or getting the assignment done. So you might be tempted. There will come times when you're a little bit behind or you want to catch up quickly and you might be tempted. I always try to think this way. Who am I? You know, what kind of person am I? Uh, you know, think about the, uh, the letters of the alphabet. So we've got B, that's birth, and we've got C and D, and D is death. So what is the C in between B and D? Well, between birth and death are the choices that we make, B, C, D. Birth, choices, death. The choices that we make is what determines how we live between the B and the C in our life. So you aren't really learning who you are, you're making yourself who you are. And you're becoming who you want to be with every one of those choices that you make. So try to resist the urge. And we have a couple of programs that will help you to do that. One is called Class Companion. Now this is really brand new, we just added it in the last week or so. So I'm, I'm not gonna jump right in with both feet to using Class Companion, but I may add it to a few lessons to your classes and we'll see how it goes. All right, what is Class Companion? It's an AI that'll help you learn. 
it's embedded right in Canvas. It's really most useful for writing assignments, but basically it's a program that lets you have a discussion with an, an AI that's approved. So again, let's go back to the question about what's the difference between mitochondria in a cell and chloroplasts in a cell. Well, if I give you that question, tell me the difference between the two, and you don't know what mitochondria are, you can type into Class Companion, what are mitochondria? And mitochondria will, or the Class Companion will help you to work your way through it. I'm not gonna be using it for the first couple of weeks. I want you to get used to Canvas and my classes and all that. We'll talk about that more when I start putting it in the lessons. We also have a new thing called plagiarismcheck.org. So plagiarism is taking someone else's work and making it look like it's your own. And a lot of students don't know what is plagiarism and what's not. Some people think it's fine to just copy and paste something from a website or from ChatGPT. It's not though. Anything that you copy and paste is not your own work. My goal is to help you learn the right way to use the internet, to get information, to help you learn without plagiarizing. So we have this new program. It again is embedded right in Canvas and it allows you to check your work. So whenever there's a writing assignment, whether it's a lab report or an essay or a test that has written answers, you're going to be given two attempts for any of that kind of, of written assignment. When you submit it the first time, this plagiarism check will tell you whether or not and what percentage is plagiarized. It'll come back saying 40% of this assignment has been copied off the internet. And you go, oh, well, I need to make sure that I give my own answers instead. Then you resubmit it to me for grading. So I will grade the second time. I won't be grading the first one. So this is a learning opportunity for you to see so that you can learn what plagiarism is and what it's not. Why does it matter? If you plagiarize in college, you'll get thrown out of the college. If you plagiarize in a job, you'll be fired. So you need to learn how to use resources without cheating, without copying from them. Anybody have any questions about AI or plagiarism? All right, excellent. I know you, it's probably stuff you've heard a lot before. Uh, I do keep attendance. I keep track of your attendance and participation and both of those are part of your grade. So what I do is at the end of the semester, I look and see if you have, have been here and if you've participated, I bump your grade up a little bit. I don't deduct for not being here. I understand life sometimes gets in the way. If you know you're not gonna be here, let me know. That's an excused absence. If you let me know that you're not gonna be here. When you come in late or come in, yeah, come in late or have to leave early, just do so quietly. Don't talk to anybody or say, sorry, I was late. Just come in as quietly as you can. All right. <clears throat> so class behavior, what do we need to do in these live classes? This is just not a problem with AIM Academy. We don't have trouble. Um, you guys, this, the, uh, these students, you, you students are always respectful of one another. I've really never had an issue. The biggest issue with class behavior that we face is when one student knows all the answers and monopolizes the conversation. So it can be hard if you know the answer to everything and nobody else is answering, it can be hard for you not to just jump in but I wanna make sure we give everybody a chance to talk if they want to. So if I notice that you are monopolizing the conversation, I will contact you and I will say, try to give other students a chance, all right? All right, so um, let's see here. I think I covered that, yep, covered all that. If you have a shared computer, make sure that you log out of Canvas at the end of each session. So this is really important if your parent is using the same computer that you are. And they're looking at their parent account and you go and sit down and you go to your biology class and there's no submit button to submit your assignment. That's probably because you're logged into your parent's account. If that happens, just log out and log back in. All right, but a little bit more information about due dates. Um, it's important for you to stay with the due dates for a lot of reasons, but my due dates are flexible. So I want you to try and stick with those due dates as much as you can. First of all, it'll keep you from getting frustrated because you look and you see that you're way past the due dates on things. That's a, not a fun place to be. So try to avoid that frustration. Also, staying current with the due dates helps these live classes to be more meaningful. When we are studying about fish in the, the daily lessons, we'll also be talking about fish in the live class. 
that comes right after that. So it'll help you to understand what's happening. Also, I do send out progress reports periodically to parents. The only thing I have to go with is the due dates. So if you have fallen a little bit behind, your grade might be lower than you would expect if you have fallen behind. This is an important one. This may be different than some of the other classes that you've taken with other teachers. All quizzes and tests in my classes are open book and open note. That means if you don't know the answer to something, I want you to go back to the lesson, to go back to the book and find the answer. So people often ask that why. Students always say to me, why is everything open book? Don't you want us to memorize and study things? There are some things that it will be important for you to remember. Those things will go over repeatedly. We'll cover them again and again and again. But you guys have all the facts in the universe right here on your computer. You have it all on your phone if you have a phone. The day of having to memorize a bunch of facts is, is really over. And nowhere in life outside of school are you asked to answer a question using only the knowledge in your head. You're always given the opportunity to look something up. So it's really important that you learn how to get that information, that you learn how to learn. So that's what my goal is. So it's been shown that when um, a student encounters something, a person, a person has to encounter something new somewhere between five and seven times in order to move it into their long-term memory. When you go back to the book, that's another encounter. And then when you write it down again, that's another encounter. So the more times you can do that, the better. I'd rather you went back and looked something up and got the answer rather than getting it wrong because you didn't even try. So always, always give that a try. Now that does not mean that the tests and quizzes are easy because they're open book. I don't have a lot of fact-based questions in my, in my lessons, especially later on in the year, especially at the honors level. You guys will have more what we call critical thinking, where you have to process things, more problem solving kind of questions. I use case studies a lot for that. Like, here's the scenario, what's happening, where you have to put together bits of information. So you have not only my permission, you have my encouragement to go back to the book, go back to your notes, find answers, the things that you aren't completely sure of. All right, we have two sections of honors biology because we want to keep the class sizes small enough to be really beneficial to you. So the only difference between those two is the day the live class meets. The live classes are identical. So you guys today will be getting the same content that the Monday or the Wednesday section gets. In general, it's best if you stay to the Monday class. You get to know each other that way. You get more comfortable with one another that way. But if ever you can't come on a Monday, you can feel free to come on Wednesday, right? You can always, it's the same link. So you just come at the time that's listed on the home page. All right, that's it for housekeeping, for the business end of things. Before we start talking about what science is, uh, anybody have any questions about any of that? Anything that you want more clarification on? All right, excellent. Let me arrange this a little bit here. Okay, so... We can divide science up into two main branches, pure science and applied science. Anybody have any idea what the difference is? What's the difference between pure science and applied science? Think about the word applied and what that might mean. Ben. Um, my guess is pure science is like actual information that we understand and blind is more of a, a guess. You you're, you got it right on the first one and you're close on the second one. Pure science is um, is knowledge. Basically, it's, it's, the, it's, it's what you know. So here we can look at it this way. It's a branch of science that focuses on just simply discovering new things, not doing anything with that knowledge, just simply knowing for the sake of knowing, no other reason, that's pure science. So now applied science is going to apply that knowledge. Applied science is the branch of science that focuses on using that knowledge, okay? Let's talk about, let's take a look here. It might make it a little bit more clear. So we're gonna use both applied and pure science in our class. We're gonna learn a lot 
about pure science. Then we'll apply that information to solve some problems. So pure science says, why is this important? Where applied science says, how can I use this? What is the benefit to this? So pure scientists seek to understand how and why the world works, where applied scientists use that knowledge to solve problems and make life better. So like learning how electricity works, that's pure science. Wondering how can I make electricity bring light into a home, that's applied science, okay? All right, let's move on to talking specifically about this uh, problem solving approach. Hopefully this is not new to any of you guys. Hopefully you've had the scientific method before. You've at least heard of it before. This is really at the core of biology. It's this problem solving approach. And it is so important that we're gonna talk a lot about it this year. It'll be the basis that you build your lab reports on. And it basically has five steps to it. When you look up scientific method, you'll see anything from five steps to 10, depending on who writes it. But it is um, a problem solving approach. So you can think of it that way. And you can use it for things that are not just science. You can use it to solve anything. I'll, I'll talk through that in just a second here. So we use the scientific method in all the sciences in not only biology, but also chemistry, physics, geology, psychology. Not all scientists will use the scientific method, but it's a good starting point. It's a good core approach. It's logical. It's um, supported by evidence. So here are the steps right here. Um, it is a series of steps used to acquire knowledge about the world. It's so basically a way of thinking about science. So here's the steps. First, we make an observation. You observe something that's happening. Then you ask a question about what you observe. You form a hypothesis. You make a prediction based on the hypothesis. Test the prediction with an experiment. Analyze the results and draw conclusions. Communicate results. All right, let's, uh, let's do a, a real simple example of this. Let's say you just baked a, a plate full of chocolate chip cookies and you set it on the counter in the kitchen. You went into your room and when you came back, it was gone. The plate's still there, but all the cookies are gone. All right, you observe something. You just observed missing cookies. The cookies are gone. That's your observation. Now you're gonna ask a question. What question might you ask? Reagan. What happened to the cookies? Yeah, what happened to the cookies? So there's a couple possibilities here. We wanna form a hypothesis. We'll talk a little bit more about hypotheses in a minute. In this very simple example, we can just use a hypothesis as what we mean by an, an educated prediction, an educated guess. You might say, my brother ate the cookies, all right? Uh, so that's your hypothesis. My hypothesis is my brother ate the cookies. I can now make a prediction based on the hypothesis. If I bake more cookies, my brother will eat them too. <laughs> that would be a prediction. So now you can test the prediction with an experiment. You bake more cookies. You put them down. You, you go back to the, uh, at the end of the experiment, the cookies are still there, but your brother's still in the room. <clears throat> so now you can say, hmm, Maybe I have to analyze these results and draw a different conclusion. So you can cycle back a few times. And what we might end up finding out as we form a new hypothesis is it actually was the dog who ate the cookies. All right, so that's a problem solving method. All right, let's talk about the different steps of the scientific method. All right, the first step is an observation. An observation is something you notice using your senses or a tool to extend your senses, like a microscope, a telescope, um, a computer, some kinds of tools that you would use, um, even a magnifying glass. Those expand your senses a little bit. So these are things that you um, either use your senses themselves or something that expands in order to identify, to make you wonder. That's what the observation is. So here's an example. <clears throat> About two years ago, the country of China put an end to online gaming if you're under 18 on weekdays. So anybody under the age of 18 who lives in China 
cannot be online, play online games Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. They can play one hour on Friday, one hour on Saturday, and one hour on Sunday. Okay, that was a law about three years ago. They observed something. The authorities observed something. What do you think they might have observed? What led to this action? What possible reason could there have been or observation that they made to make that kind of a change? Toby. Maybe to uh, improve their like academic, um, like their academic level or something. Okay, you're on the right track, Toby, but they observed something. What did they observe? I guess just too much time on uh, on the screens. There you go. They could have observed that kids were spending too much time on screens. What else? That's one possibility. There's a lot of possibilities. What other possibility could there be? Um, they could have observed their pro productivity. Yep, they may have seen productivity decrease. Good. What else? What does productivity look like when you're under the age of 18? A lot of times it looks at grades, right? They may have noticed grades dropping. They may have noticed kids were tired in school. They may have noticed that kids were um, coming to school late. There's a lot of things that they might have noticed, but they definitely observed something that led them to do that. All right, so we have observation. The next part of the scientific method is asking a question. Now, what question do you think that the Chinese government might have asked based on the observation? Let's pick one of them. Let's say the observation was, we're starting to see student grades dropping kind of across the board. So what question could they have asked that was based on that? Kate. Why are their grades dropping? Yeah, excellent. A lot of times the questions start with why or what if, how, when, all those kind of question words. So they might have said, why are their grades dropping? All right, so we had an observation, grades are dropping. Now we have a question, why are the grades dropping? What's the third step in the scientific method? What comes after asking a question? Anybody remember? Reagan. Hypothesis. Yep, hypothesis, excellent. Now sometimes in between question and hypothesis, there will be some research. So sometimes you, they'll, you'll go look something up and see if somebody else already has the answer. So it's possible in this case, you know, using this scenario, maybe they asked, I wonder why their grades are dropping. Why are student grades dropping? And they said, you know what? In another country, when they saw student grades dropping, they limited their online gaming time and they saw the grades go up. Let's try that. That would be research. You don't always do research, but sometimes. And research can absolutely can be in any of these arrows. Any of those could be research. But let's go with hypothesis. So what do we mean when we say hypothesis? Toby. I guess like an idea that you have to prove, but it's not like, it's not proven yet. Yeah, good, good. So a hypothesis is, um, it is the idea that you have to test, something that you have to test and then something that you're gonna look for. So a really good hypothesis has two parts to it. It has a first part, which is a statement that guides what you're going to do, it tells you what your experiment's gonna be. And then the second part is what you're gonna look for. It's a prediction of the outcome of your research. Excuse me. So taking a look at this here, hypothesis answer a question. It's a possible answer to a scientific question and it has to be testable, but it doesn't need to be supported by scientific evidence. Not yet. Once you test it, then it might be, but not at the beginning. So a good hypothesis should be written in what we call if then format, where if tells you what you're going to do, and then tells you what you're gonna look for. So let's say I've got um, a plant, my if then for that could be, if I water my plant with boiling water, 
then my plant will die, right? If I water my plant with acid rain, then my plant will die. If I water my plant with enough water, but not too much, then my plant will, will do well. You hear the if and the then? The if tells me what I'm gonna do, the then tells me what I'm going to look for. So for our, um, our, our study, the, the China thing, um, what might be a reasonable hypothesis, if then, for the students getting bad grades and decreasing the, the amount of online time? If, Reagan. If we take away video games, then their grades will go up. Excellent. So that tells you what you're going to do. That tells you what your experiment is. The if, if we take away video games or limit the, limit the video game time, then tells you what you're going to measure. What are you going to look for? We're going to look for grades to improve. If I do something, then something will happen. So sometimes this if then hypothesis is called a conditional statement. Often when we say the word hypothesis, what we actually mean is a conditional statement. So in this conditional statement, the hypothesis, the if part tells us what we're going to do. The conclusion or the prediction is the second, the then part. The conclusion is the result. Now look at these two words here. These are important independent and dependent. If I do this, then this will happen. The if is the dependent and uh, the independent variable. The then is the dependent variable. Now these terms can be a little bit confusing. So I wanna try to clear them up. Those of you who have been with me before, yep, we're gonna watch the guy sing again. <laughs> if you remember that song from before, really does help you to remember. We'll get to that in a slide or two here. So whenever we're doing any kind of a controlled scientific experiment, we have three kinds of what we call variables. So variables are basically, think of them as the parts of the experiment, the things that are involved. We have the independent variable. That's what you change. That's the change that you make. You know, if I swipe my hand across this desk, then all my papers will fall onto the floor. Swiping my hand across the desk is what I do. That's the independent variable. The papers falling to the floor is what I observe. That's the dependent variable. Everything else I keep the same. They are controlled. The controlled variables are the ones you keep the same. So taking a look at this picture here, the independent variable is the variable that's changed. So what are we changing? We're changing the amount of water. That's what we're gonna change. Independent variable is the one you change. The dependent variable is what you measure or the thing that is affected by the change that you made. In this case, it would be the size of the plant the number of leaves, whether it's alive or it's dead. Here they are again, the three kinds of variables. Independent variable is the thing you change. The dependent variable is the thing that you measure, like the height of the plant, the health of the plant. Everything else is controlled in a controlled experiment because in a controlled experiment, we limit it to only one variable. All right, here's the song. This hopefully will help you to remember. Independent variables are the ones you change. Independent variables are the ones you change. Dependent ones are what you measure. Control will stay the same, whatever. Independent variables are the ones you change. Okay, you guys all know what the word control means. When you control something, you keep it the same. You don't let it change. You control it. So really, all you have to remember is the first one. Independent variables are the ones you change. If you remember that, and you remember that little part of the song, independent variables are the ones you change, you can remember then controls are the other one. They're the thing that you measure. Now we'll see him again, because I think this song is a good way to help you remember. After all these years, I still kind of sing this song in my head when I'm talking about dependent and independent variables, and we will discuss those. There are other names for those too. We have a manipulated variable. That's the thing that you change. So we'll talk about all of those as the year goes on. All right, so back to hypothesis. So the, the observations that the Chinese government made led them to form a hypothesis. We talked about some potential hypotheses here. If we do this, then this will happen. If we limit video games, then we will see um, grades go up. So that would be the hypothesis that they made. 
Now, the next is an experiment. After you've made your hypothesis, you do an experiment. And this is where the real value of the if-then hypothesis comes in. If you've written your hypothesis in if-then format, you know exactly what you're going to do. If we limit screen time, that's what you're going to do. You're going to limit screen time. If I water my plant with boiling water, that's what I'm going to do. That's my independent variable. Tells me what my experiment is going to be. All right. Now, remember that in a controlled experiment, we're only going to change one variable. Whenever possible in science, we want to do a controlled experiment. It's really hard to do, though. I'll tell you that right now. Think about a person. Think about doing an experiment on, on a person. <laughs> well, you can't, you can't keep everything the same. It's really hard, but we want to try wherever we can. We want to try to make a controlled experiment because most experiments are better if we only control one variable. Take a look at the plant there. So if what we're doing is an experiment to determine whether a mung bean plant grows better when watered with 40 degree water or 80 degree water, what if we didn't just change the water? What if we also changed the soil? the amount of sunlight, the temperature in the room, the temperature of the water, the humidity in the room. What if we changed all that? Would we know which one of those caused the effect that we saw? No, we have to change just one thing so that we know what it is that made the change. So look at this experiment that, controls, that compares these two different water temperatures and plant growth. So what is the variable that's changed? What is the independent variable? Toby. The temperature of the water. Temperature of the water is the thing that we are changing. That is our independent variable, the thing that we change. Name some variables that are not changed. What are some of our controls? Ben. The plants themselves. The plants themselves wouldn't work if we had one mung bean and one corn plant, right? We got to have the same kind of plant. What else? Kate. The amount of sunlight. Amount of sunlight. Good one. Reagan. The size of the planter it's in. Yep. Absolutely. We couldn't have one very tiny little pot and one giant pot. That would be another variable. Carson. The soil inside of the pot. Yep. We would want to make sure we had the same soil. If one of them was very rocky clay filled soil and the other was very nutrient rich black soil, that wouldn't, that would that'd be another variable thrown in there. Basically the variables that are controlled is everything that's not the independent variable. You want to control everything else as much as you possibly can. So things like um, all the things that you guys mentioned are called controlled variables. Now, they're not of interest in the study. We're not really concerned about them. It doesn't really matter what the humidity of the room is, what kind of, of pot we use, what kind of soil we use. We just need to make sure they're the same so that they don't influence the outcome of the experiment. All right. So we only want to test one variable at a time. In a controlled experiment, we also have what we call an experimental group and a control group. So don't let that word control confuse you. We use the same word for the experiment and for the variables in the experiment. The experimental group is the one you experiment on. So if we have... Um, uh, you know, an, an example would be the kids in China. If we went back to that one, we could use, maybe they could say, okay, so for the kids who live in Beijing, we're going to do, we're going to limit screen time. But for the kids who live in Shanghai, we're not. We're just going to leave things the same. The ones who lived in Beijing would be the experimental group. The ones who lived in Shanghai would be the control group. They don't receive um, the, the variable that was changed. So experimental control. Again, we're going to go over these as time goes on. I'm just really introducing all this today. Now, the next thing that we do, it's not listed here, but it would be right in this area right here, is we're going to analyze some data. Now, we analyze the data to see whether or not it supports our hypothesis or does not support it. If it supports our hypothesis, we often go right into our conclusion and then publish our results. If it does not support our hypothesis, 
we then often will have to go back and make a new hypothesis in order to be able to do something. So this is a, a nice chart right here. We often will put the data in a graph or a chart because it makes it really easy for somebody to understand. Keep that in mind. Whenever you can put data in a graph or in a chart, do so because it makes it a lot easier for your reader to be able to tell at a glance. If I had a big paragraph here that said plant group one had was grown in soil with a pH of 6.0 and grew to 25.4 centimeters. Plant group two was in soil with a pH of 6.2 and grew to 33. If I just had a big paragraph like that, it would take you a long time to figure it out. Looking at this right here, somebody give me a conclusion. What conclusion would you draw based on this graph? Just a quick look and you can come to a conclusion. We're growing soil in different pHs. Eight. Six point six would be the um, best pH. Six point six to six point eight; those are both the same. So yeah, if we started at six point six, so our conclusion could be something like the the best pH level for uh, for soil for plant growth is between six point six and six point eight. We could also say soil above a pH of 6.8 or below a pH of 6.4 is not optimal for plant growth. So we can go either way with our, but, but you can see here how putting it in a graph like this lets you see at a glance what, what your data says. Now, when we're talking about data, there are two kinds of data. Think about the difference between the two words, quality and quantity. If you've got a quantity of something, you have a number. I have a quantity of coins. I have 15 coins, that's my quantity. The quality of my coins is, well, they're they're all pennies. So they're all copper colored and they're all a little bit tarnished and you know they're all a certain size. That would be quality. So quantity gives you a number. Quant, qual, quantitative gives you a number, qualitative does not. It is something that you would, um, would observe. So let's look at Stella's curtain in the background behind her. So a quantity, a quantitative data of her curtain would be how long the curtains are, how wide the curtains are. That would be a quantity, something I can measure. A quality would be the color, the fabric that it's made of. Those would be things I could describe that I wouldn't be using a number. So qualitative data deals with quantity well, I'm sorry, I think, I think I keep saying the one, wrong one. Quantitative data deals with quantities that are expressed in numbers. Qualitative does not. Qualitative gives us the quality of something. Now, with regard to data, let's think about this study in China. How will China collect the data? They've got to collect data from this experiment that they're doing. There's going to be some challenges to collecting that data. Anybody have any idea what the challenges might be? You know, you don't just make a big change in a scientific experiment and then never check in to see if it's working. Toby. I mean, I guess figuring out that the, that the child is like, is only spending that amount of time per day. Like maybe they went to a friend's house and did it anyway or. Yeah. So that's what we call compliance. And compliance is often hard when you're dealing with people. Getting people to do what you tell them to do is not always easy. You know, if I said to all of you, um, guess what? The, the Congress has just passed a law that now nobody under the 18 can be online during, uh, you know, playing games on the weekdays. A lot of you would probably try to find ways to get around that, right? You would not want to comply with that law. So compliance is an issue. What's another one? The one major issue when we're talking, uh, oh, go ahead, Toby. I guess making sure that like, if the, if a student's grade like increases that it was because of, of the video game uh, deduction. Right, right. So, you know, here's a, here's a question. Let's suppose that they did notice that the students 
grades did increase. Are they increasing because of video games? Because they decreased the video games? Or maybe our students sleeping more now because they're not playing video games at night. So is it sleep? Like I said, there's too many variables when we're dealing with people. It's really hard to um, to keep to keep those variables controlled. Kate, I think you had your hand up. It, it could um, work for a little bit, and then they could their grades could go down again later while doing the same thing. Yep, time is a big issue. So this is an issue in a lot of the science that we do. A lot of the um, uh, like medical research that's done is they'll test a, a new a new drug or a new vitamin or something like that and they'll test it for a month. Is that enough time? Maybe, maybe not. Is a month enough time in this experiment for China to be testing, you know, how did their grades go up in a month? Probably not. We probably have to be looking at years in order to know whether this worked or not. That's a major limitation to this study. Okay, one other thing. China is not just limiting video game time. They're doing a couple other things too. They've limited what they call celebrity culture where students have celebrity heroes. They don't want that to be happening anymore. And they've banned online education with any foreign teachers from a country that isn't China for anyone under the age of 18. So is this a controlled experiment? This is not a controlled experiment. They're changing too many variables at the same time. All right, now, no worries if a lot of this is confusing because we will continue to talk about variables and independent and dependent and controls. Uh, we'll go over it enough that it'll become pretty second nature to you. All right, anybody have any questions about the scientific method? We talked a little bit a few minutes ago, we were talking about AI, about the, a code of ethics about, you know, your being someone who works with integrity. Well, there's a code of ethics that really covers all of science. Um, no matter what field you're in, these are things that scientists are expected to be able to do. They're expected to be able to work in a skilled and careful manner and pursue training that makes them more knowledgeable in their field. They're expected to communicate possible conflicts of interest. We'll talk about that in a second. Try to take all action to avoid dishonesty. Be courteous toward peers, recognizing their discovery and other con contributions to science. Confirm that all research is objective, well-grounded, and lawful. Reduce negative effects of research on living organisms and their environment, and communicate openly about scientific issues that impact society. So that last one, I think of all the things that happened during the COVID years, that was the one that upset me the most as a scientist. Communication during COVID was discouraged. It was often even prevented. So think about that. That's against the scientist's code of ethics. We're supposed to communicate openly about scientific ideas that impact society. But some people say we needed to close down communication. Anybody, anybody have any thoughts about that? You know, when something is a public health issue, should scientists stop communicating about it? Who decides what communication gets out there? Who decides which views are, are okay and which ones are not? Ben. Uh, well, I, I don't know that much about the subject, but it seems to me this is kind of um, a collapse of the business world with uh, the scientific world because of these huge scientific uh, corporations that are making the vaccines. And my guess is that that's the reason why they're not sharing the information since that would impact their business. But I don't know that. Okay. Much yeah. Interesting. Interesting hypothesis. That's where conflict of interest comes in, Ben. That's exactly what that is. So there's a page in your textbook um, on page 23 in your book. There is a section that's called issues in biology when scientists have a conflict of interest. So I want to talk about that for the last six minutes that we have in class. So we're expected, as scientists, we are expected to be completely honest about our investigations. So doctors are expected to place the welfare of their patients first, but conflicts of interest can happen. And when they do, they threaten the credibility of the doctor or the researcher. 
So a conflict of interest, what that means is when a person's work is influenced by financial gain or fame or future work or favoritism. So the example they give in the book is, suppose scientists are receiving funds to test a new anti-cancer drug. So they're getting that money from somewhere. If research experiments show that that drug is not very effective, think about it. You're getting money to test this drug from a drug company and your research shows that the drug is not very effective. You might be tempted to conceal those results so that you don't lose your funding. So let's talk about different viewpoints about this one. Some scientists say regulation is necessary. They think that since the public has to be able to trust the work of science, there have to be rules to preserve the integrity of the science. And they think that every profession should regulate its members and every scientific publication should have rules to help them to avoid conflicts of interest. What do you guys think? Anybody think that there should be rules to prevent conflict of interest? Should they be forbidden to do work that might result in financial gain? Should they be for not allowed to do work that involves them becoming famous because they did it? Should funding come from somewhere besides the company that's making the whatever the product is? The other viewpoint, let's look at the other side of the story. Other scientists think that Conflict of interest regulation, so having laws that prevent that conflict of interest from happening aren't necessary because most researchers are honest anyway. Most of them are objective about their work and it's unfair to assume that they're gonna be dishonest just because there might be some money to be gained from it. They think that if we didn't have the opportunity to get extra funding for work, there wouldn't be new things that would be developed. So if we put restriction on things, we make it so that people can't make money so that there can't be a conflict of interest, we're gonna shut down any progress in some of these areas. So it's important, they say, that scientists be able to investigate anything, even if it means there might be an opportunity for them to make personal money, to make money themselves. Hmm, what do you guys think? Think about how the viewpoints might be different, whether you were a group of scientists doing work or the company that's paying for the research or the people who will want to benefit from that new medication. Toby. I mean, I, I think that scientists should be allowed to profit off, off of things because it could um, like accelerate the process because money is a pretty good, pretty good like motivation, I guess. Hard to live without it, isn't it? Ben. I think that's possible to have regulations that would uh, um, make sure that uh, scientific research is ethical for the patients and for the business while also not uh, encroaching upon their freedom to, you know, make a living for themselves. So you're going to fall somewhere in the middle, not complete regulations, but not none. You want to have some regulations. Yeah. Anybody else? <laughs> Kate. Maybe there should just be regulations that say you have to um, do the exact same thing no matter how much money you could or could not make. Okay. Yep. Any other thoughts? All right, good thoughts, good thoughts. All right, I'm gonna end today with just a little cute video. I thought you guys might like to see. This is a uh, an elephant watching a guy play the drums.
like a kid, isn't it? You hear the drums say, my turn. <laughs> Pull it close and start playing myself. Gotta love animals. I love learning about them in biology. All right, terrific job today. Anybody have any questions? All right, thank you for your participation, for leaving your cameras on and for coming to class today. If you have any questions in the meantime, before we meet next time, send them my way. All right, have a great week, everybody. Don't wait too Bye. long to get started with the week's work. <laughs> Bye. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.